welcome to our second section. Today is December 5th, 2012, and uh, we are very glad that uh, Professor Valid Abdullah is here to share with us uh, with some, some of his uh, experience uh, in the research uh, academic area. So, Professor Walid uh, Abdullah is from University of uh, Auckland, and his research interests including the um, um, human biometrics, uh, speech signal processing, active noise control, and, and so on. So, um, hi, Professor um, Walid. Hi. So, um, firstly, uh, could, you, could you briefly introduce to us your research lab and the newly developed research? Thank you very much. I'm uh, greatly delighted to be interviewed and uh, I hope that I can share some of my experience in academia and to probably pave the path for some youngster to go through the same or probably make use of that. My research area is actually, um, basically I'm working on developing algorithms and those algorithms can be put everywhere like a tomato you can do salad or you can do cooking, whatever. So algorithm is, is an essential thing. The, uh, so, but I oriented the, I, 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 I've been interested in uh, signal processing. So I oriented all the things that is under the umbrella of signal processing. So one of the uh, major uh, research areas I'm working on is a speech signal processing and also uh, human biometrics. Human biometrics could include part of the speech because speaker recognition can be considered as a biometric. It's a very strong, it's a very good and a lot of people are interested in but still not fully developed but yet it's very important because it's a way of communication using telephone, mobiles and this is very proliferated uh, devices for communication among people. Um, the other area that I'm active in is active noise control. Basically, it's, uh, it's something that you filter the noise or reduce the noise by introducing what is called anti noise. You see that if you add two signals anti phase, you can get that to a minimum. Uh, 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 level of the of the noise, but the problem is how to estimate the noise and how to get the anti noise from that. So it's uh, the, those areas actually are uh, very challenging areas, and we normally concentrate on developing develop the theory behind these and also put that into some applications. For instance, um, uh, speech recognition, one of the uh, things under the umbrella of uh, uh, signal processing, speech signal processing, is, uh, is developing engine for anything. For instance, you put it in a robot. We have in our department uh, a very strong uh, group working on health boat. And that's uh, one of the components within this project is developing a speech recognition uh, engine to be used by elderly people. And it's, uh, so this is a, a kind of very interesting thing to me. And I find myself through these research that it's all the time, never get bored from research because variety of it and you can enjoy all of them whenever you get bored from one type switch to the other one, but all of them pouring in a, in a very uh, uh, lucrative lines of research, so I'm really enjoying in, in getting through these lines. It's interesting you said that um, yeah, one of your research interests is in biometric system uh, research, so could you please give us a little detail about your newly developed biometrics authentic Authentication system. Biometric system is, is actually is, um, something that is research area which is uh, booming mm -hmm. 
recently because of the commercial impact. It's a multi-billion uh, industry. And in 2001, uh, MIT Review stated that one of the uh, main technology that will change the world or have great impact on the world is biometrics. Mm -hmm. Biometrics is basically uh, getting or acquiring features from a human. So you don't need to bring car or remember something. It's with you. You can use your fingerprint. You can use uh, uh, your face to be recognized. You don't need to provide anything, but the system could get some features from that and uh, recognize you or auth authenticate your identity. And it's uh, it will go everywhere, and it started from even entering the park, Disneyland. It's not very far from LA now. It's um, you can see that it's uh, uh, they are using the fingerprints with the car. When they get into the park, they have to use it. So it's uh, that's the thing. Um, but we are working on fingerprints. The spider is an, an, an old technique has been used for over 100 years, but still there are a lot of room of improvement, a lot of room which hasn't been discovered yet. Mm -hmm. But the good thing is, it has been proved that it's unique because it's very long history of proving it, coming it through mega or giga or tera uh, uh, size of uh, databases. So it is the biometrics that it's, there is no uh, suspect that it's unique among people, even the dead and alive. And uh, so it can be used for differentiating. This is one of the things, but the other thing that is very challenging and less research in it is securing that. It's because the problem with the biometric is when you say biometric is robust and they stay with you for your life, especially for the fingerprint to start from the seventh month and the fetus of the, uh, uh, of the mother. So it starts from that time and just the size of it is changing but the pattern is kept for the whole life. So if somebody get that, you can, there is no way on, on replacing that. You cannot replace your finger. So it's not like a credit card, when you lose it, you can change it. Yeah. Fingerprints, when you lose it, you are doomed. You cannot change it. So everybody can use it, or whoever got your uh, biometric can use it. So it's one of the things that people are still hesitant about and not very motivated about using it, is how to secure the biometric, where to put it. You cannot trust anyone. Can you secure or not, or can you assure that uh, biometrics will not be distributed among authorities? Okay, so people don't like that to happen. So there is uh, a branch of research which is called uh, cancelable or cancelable biometrics or uh, uh, securing the templates is by not using the biometric itself, but you map it to another domain using some mathematical techniques to map the biometric into another domain and this domain shouldn't be, and this mapping shouldn't be reversible, mm -hmm. okay? In this case you cannot, if you get it in that domain, you cannot get the original biometric. So you do not apply or use the original biometric, but you use the mapping. If somebody or, or if the mapped biometric get compromised, okay, you can simply just change the mapping and you get another one. So this is one of the techniques. It's pretty challenging, and we try to do, to do some some success in that line. The other thing is that other biometrics which are not very well uh, known by many people, such as the the vein. The vein of the of the palm, for instance, oh. the vein of the palm, it is 
The interesting thing about it, it's, it cannot be seen, not like the other biometrics. So, for instance, the face, it's among people, people can look at it. Your fingerprints, you may leave it behind. So these are dangerous things because they can follow you. But for the vein, unless you are using infrared camera or near infrared camera, you cannot find it. So if you touch something, you don't actually put anything there or nobody can look at it, how it looks like. So this is one of the interesting biometrics we are working on now. We try to get some good result about about using that. And also there is finger pain. So uh, some companies are producing the uh, sensors for palm, mm -hmm. like Fujitsu, like uh, 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 NEC companies, they are producing that. But actually it's very simple to use, to make one. Just use a near infrared LED and uh, a camera, you can do that. But these are sophisticated systems that we are using. And Hitachi also using, uh, uh, producing a sensor which is for finger pain. So we are interested in these kind of things which are not very common on people. And on top of that, one of the biometrics is also we are interested in, we have some good development in the speaker that you identify, pe identify people or recognize them from their voice. And the other one is that we are also working in, is on gate. People, uh, the gate of the people is, uh, is different from one person to other person. It's not quite unique, but there are some claims that they are unique. I'm personally not very convinced it's unique. But it's very good for many applications like tracking, or tracking activities, or certain activities, or tracking people at short distances, border control. So there, it has some uh, very good applications because you don't need to see the detail of the person. You just need the silhouette of the person. It can be done by any camera, very cheap camera from long distances. So these are kind of uh, uh, some of the biometrics we are working Many new directions where we are studying. So, um, for new graduates and PhD students, the first question that come, come to us is like, uh, uh, how to choose a, a suitable career path? So, for example, industry or academic. Do you have any suggestions? Well, if the graduate of the PhD asking himself this question, this is, I'm going to tell him that it's too late to ask yourself this question. Uh, okay. You should ask yourself this question. For the first time you put your, uh, your foot in the university, mm -hmm. where do you want to go? From that time, first year or probably the second year or even third year, but not later than that. Mm -hmm. You ask yourself whether you prefer going to the industry or going to the academy. Sometimes it's, it's now uh, many companies also hire PhD, PhD students and it's or PhD uh, graduate. But the thing is that it's uh, industry does mostly they do not prepare PhD. Now the interest is more in the master degree. So when the student is when he get to the university or she get to the university, ask himself whether he or she would like to go industry or academy. Mm -hmm. Why is that? It has to come very early. Because in this case, if you have options in your study, you direct yourself toward, for instance, I would like to go to industry. I concentrate everything on implementation. Doing very, being a very good programmer, uh, going through any course that provide with tools, with uh, hardware implementation, uh, software implementation, things like that, that it could be lucrative or increase your value in the eyes of the industry. However, if you are interested in academia, 
you have to concentrate more on mathematics, mm. on something which is uh, down to statistics, so any option or any course that provides you with these kind of things of, of, of skills that is mostly mathematics. Mathematics is something essential. Mathematics, signal processing, these are challenging and tough. Many students try to get away from them by going to options they do not go through that for many reasons that they, they want. But it's so you have once you decide at the university you can choose even the courses that increase your value in this direction or that direction. If you say that I'm graduated now, where do I go? Whether I go, it means that it's this plan comes very late. Yet it's not something which is uh, if somebody hasn't thought about that until uh, finished the degree. Well, it's just his chances might be more difficult to get a good chance because he might not be prepared for the industry. Say I would like to go to industry, and when it comes to the uh, his experience or her experience, you see that student didn't get any uh, uh, path for the industry, no skill or implementation or probably programming or something. Probably everything selected in mathematics, even the PhD, the research. So even that, so I would like to go to industry, I have to get something in my research, which is more toward what the industry are looking for. So I have to look at this. What are the things that are the industry are looking for? So I get my research in that line. Mm -hmm. So those things has to be planned early. And this is what a lot of research have been done. Students who from the first year or second year decide where to go, they are very, very successful. And there are several, several studies on that, studies which goes for 10 or 15 years. So they found that students who decided very early where to go, and they plan for that, they become very successful, whether in academia or industry. Yeah, Professor Lally, um, as a successful researcher, as you, so, um, could you please share us some tips on how to balance between your life and the things of research? Uh, well, it's balance is it's very difficult. Uh, this is a very good question. What do you uh, mean by life? Some researchers think that life is in the labs. <laughs> When they find, when they get into a state that you prepare your tea and you forget to drink it, you are a good researcher. It means that you are so into the research. But this is not something which is to say about all research or something like that. People should should make a good balance between their own life, their family life, and their research life. They have to put some border. But sometimes you cannot control it. If you have a conference or a journal and there is a deadline, so everything then is shifted toward the research. So you might not find enough time for the family. But you still enjoy it and something. So it's, but you have to compensate. When you are not in that situation, you have to pay back to the family, to your life. Otherwise, life is not just sitting in the labs or doing things. It, it has to be also, research has to be with people. Research has to serve people. So if you are not with people, you are not communicating with them, you don't need, you don't know their needs. So you might from communicating with people. Sometimes you find some people suffer from certain sicknesses. You can think you have, oh, okay, why would we don't do that for them? Mm -hmm. So, being with family, with people, with, this is also useful. Because social life is very important. We shouldn't drift completely to this and that. Yeah. We have heard about some very great scientists who were 
some of them they cannot they, they forget their breakfast, their lunch, and even their dinner. But this is not very common. But if you would like to live a normal life, life is not just one thing, it's many things. Successful people, in my view, who can balance between all of them. They shouldn't go through something and leave the other things. If you are successful in one line only and you forget about you have miserable life or it's unbalanced family life, that's not a success. Good success, you can make everything going well. Probably not as much as if you concentrate on one line, mm -hmm. but you end up with a good life for yourself because you have to look up after yourself to keep your energy, to keep your thinking, you, you think better. So that's my, my view. It's balance. It's hard to get it in some cases, but it shouldn't be the norm. All the time one has to look up, ah, wait, I have to look at myself and see what I have done. So how to compensate if I drifted one line or the other. So uh, one last question is that um, we all want to know how to write uh, high quality papers. High quality paper is not one shot and it doesn't come and it probably, sometimes it doesn't come in the first, second or third or fifth year. You never know. I know that now it's uh, the the system is pushing people toward publishing, 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 publish or perish. So that's something which is people, if you ask them, why do you publish? Because the system wants it. So whenever they do something very small, they try to publish. And this is where you see millions of publications. But how many publications are there? Mm -hmm. Not many. And if you look at the 70s, the 60s, the 40s, the fundamentals came from there. Why? Because the person might work for 10 years and produce one paper, but that paper could be very fundamental. Mm -hmm. So why do you publish? Because I want to distribute my thought, because this is something which I get, which is very fundamental, very important. I want to share it with the people, I want other people to work and develop on. So at that they decide the decision of making the publication, make it that high quality. But if you are driven by, I have to publish each year five papers or ten papers, I, yes, could be one of them is very good, nine of them are, nobody will even look at that. Okay. So, how to publish a quality paper? You have to focus on, on something and keep digging on it and try to get, not, you cannot just, okay, I find this, I'll put it in a journal and it will be published. No. Okay, I find this, it's promising, I put it in a conference. So from that conference, I put it in a selective conference. It's not a conference. It's not any conference. It's just for publication. No. I have to know what are the conferences, high quality conferences, that are in the line of this paper. So I put it there and see what do I get from them. Because they give it to quality reviewers. Give you feedback. If the feedback is very encouraging, you go further in it. If there are criticism, or they find something that it's has been done, or it's, uh, sometimes even as we, we do something and there's somebody has done it, but we don't know it, about it, even with the internet. With it. But through the reviewers, good reviewers, you might get that. So if you do that through several conferences, you might end up after two attempts in a very quality conference to be accepted in these conferences, the third one could be a journal paper in a very good place because you have both these steps. Mm -hmm. So it's a step by step. You cannot jump. You can say, okay, I find this, I'll put it in. 
in that quality journal or this is great and you cannot say oh I got interesting very good result nobody had done it many people think like that but when they put it into the publication they find heaps of things so to do a very good publication it has to go step by step and with patience it's not to rush it's not to put it in a so step it's a good conference and then a good conference probably three, two, three until you say now it is well developed, I know everything about it, all the reviewer came across that this is promising, this is a new, so I can come and go to and publish that in a quality journal. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that also it's important in quality, try to make the first publication as a review paper. So if you are working on a line and to be very good instead of focusing on one thing and go over it, build a very good background on top of that and then try to write a review paper and submit it and you see what you get out of that. Because a reviewer might come up with more algorithms, more techniques have been published somewhere. So that makes you a very good base to build on. So the, the foundation is very important. If you have a weak foundation, you might build on a weak foundation and then it will collapse. So the foundation is very important. Very good survey, very good book after all the things that have been done. And it's very encouraging to do a review paper and put it in somewhere, some very good place. And then on top of that you see narrow band, narrow bits. Narrow the, 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 the survey into which line is more interesting to you. And you can you find yourself you can contribute, which is suitable to your experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's excellent. Step is best then foster review then you have uh, got a presentation. Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you for your Thank you.